this thought, as I quote the meaning of peace provided in the second parameter paragraph of the 2006 Duarte Declaration on the Human Rights of Peace, where it talks about, and I quote, the positive concept of peace, which goes beyond the strict absence of armed conflict and is linked to the economic, social, and cultural development of peoples as a condition for satisfying the basic needs of human beings, to the elimination of all kinds of violence, and to the effective respect for all human rights." End quote. Let me point out, in this context, what the UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon stated in 2009, and I quote him, peace will not take root if it comes from the outside. Building peace is primarily a national challenge and responsibility. After those two quotations, I would like to share with you my own personal thinking about peace, <clears throat> which is a synthesis of elements gathered from various sources, including observations, during my truly body experience in the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and my experiences working with grassroots communities in my own country, the Philippines. Peace <clears throat> is the presence of positive and mutually respectful social, cultural, and economic relationships. It suggests the existence of healthy inter interpersonal relationships, sustained so social and economic growth based on equality, non-discrimination, participation, and inclusion, and a working political order where everyone upholds his or her rights and responsibilities. In June 2008, the Philippines Human Rights Commission and the New Zealand Human Rights Commission embarked on a bilateral project to work together to strengthen human rights in the Philippines and in New Zealand. The project was in response to a joint request made to these two commissions, respectively, by both the Philippine President and the New Zealand Prime Minister during a visit of the former to New Zealand the previous year. After a series of meetings and consultations, the two national human rights institutions came to the conclusion that a significant human rights challenge in the Philippines is how to translate the constitutional guarantees, the laws, and strong policies asserting human rights principles into effective practice in the lives of people at the grassroots and other communities. The two commissions identified indigenous peoples as particularly susceptible to human rights deprivation and abuse. Thus, the focus of the subsequent bilateral project was to three predominantly indigenous communities in the Philippines who lived in poverty and who were marginalized and vulnerable to conflict and its attendant consequences. I was commissioned to head the Philippine program in those three years. Um, and with these partner communities to implement what we call human rights in community development process. Let me tell you about one of these communities, the Liga Ome. The province of Abusan del Sur in eastern Mindanao is home to a number of indigenous peoples and tribal groups. Among them, the Liga Ome who live in the mountainous regions of a municipality called Esperanza. Esperanza occupies one of the largest land areas in the province of Abusan, consisting of 47 villages with a total population of approximately 45,000 people, composed of immigrants from the Visayas Islands in Central Philippines and the Iga Onan themselves, who were among the earliest settlers in the area. Traditionally, the Iga Onan were nomadic, traveling from one mountain village to another in search of more fertile soil, soil and better harvest. With the passing of time and events, they settled within the confines of an area which they recognize and claim as their ancestral domain, covering the convergence of the boundaries of three big provinces. These indigenous peoples comprise what is known as the Igaonan nation, not only a tribe, but nation whose culture is rich in tradition and customs, with a Datu system, a code of conduct established by a customary law that is held sacred by all people, no matter where they may be. 
then that too leads, not as a ruler, but as an administrator based on the Datu's capacity, skills, and experience. Today, out of the 47 villages of Esperanza, only two are predominantly populated by the Oro, and they are also the most remote from the center of the municipality, preferring to settle in close proximity to Mount Sinakuman, the sacred mountain of the Oro. This mountain is also the dwelling place of Higaonan elders who constitute the traditional lawmaking body of the entire Higaonan nation. It is speculated that the mountain, aside from the thick forest cover, is rich in gold and other mineral, mineral deposits. Population estimates in these two villages are difficult to determine, owing to the mobility of residents within these mountainous regions. Located almost beyond the reach of any government service and infrastructure, these two villages on the sacred mountain were prey to armed groups with interest in the rich land and forests in the area. The Hikaonan, along with the rest of Esperanza, found themselves caught in the midst of the fierce conflicts between insurgents and government forces, legal and extra-legal fronts, and mass organizations. Thus began the history of the polarization and violence of and among Kikaona in Esperanza, traces of which were still very much apparent when our project commenced in 2008. As a first step, the project sought the consent of the Kikaona elders who urged us to work in Esperanza where the roots of conflict were located. But one of the great threat to the lives of the project team personnel because of the presence of various armed groups roaming the municipality. As the project leader, it was my responsibility to apprise the field officers who comprise the Higaonan project team that there would be dangers and threats to their life, their health, their well-being, and that they were given the freedom to withdraw from the team, but on the start. At the same time, I also made it clear to them I would personally lead the team wherever it was necessary to go. None of the three field officers would do. A few days later, the three field teams comprising the national team underwent an intensive training that I conducted along with two resource persons who were experienced in field operations. From information provided by the HITA on themselves, the following issues seem to predominate. Harassment and intimidation by armed men who were alleged fake agents, encroachment into their ancestral lands for into their logging and mining activities, extra-legal killings perpetrated allegedly by insurgents against tribal leaders, unresolved killings, presence and entry of groups whose purpose is to divide the tribe by introducing a different ideology adversely affecting their cultural identity. The team engaged with the community in gatherings held outside the municipal center, and the number of participants <coughs> sectoral representatives consistently attended. The Datus and their other community elders, the women, the young adults, with representatives from the local governments occasionally in attendance. Consensus on the community's human rights issues were slowed down considerably by discussions on the leadership issue between two respective Datus who each had their own followers, with the result of dividing the community against each other to the extent that they constantly engaged in armed combat. It was clear that the local government was perceived to be loyal to one side, alienating the community that was predominant in the army. It was also clear that this issue, having been ongoing for more than two decades, was perceived by the community to be the singular obstacle to the resolution of its human rights issues and adversely affected all areas of their development. The project team took a firm and sustained position of impartiality and objectivity with regard to the leadership issue and convinced the community that this matter was for the two leaders to resolve and encouraged their undivided attention on the priority human rights issues. The project team, sensitive to its non-partisan position and with due regard for both leaders and their respective followers, undertook efforts to appeal to them individually they were respectfully reminded that they could rely on their traditional conflict resolution process to solve the impasse for the sake of the community and its development. The human rights issues were finally agreed upon by the community and steps were taken in order to be able to address such issues. 
including um, building on their traditional culture and using their traditional culture to solve the conflicts that were at issue. A series of activities was undertaken by the community whose members designated their leaders in these activities. And tribal leaders came together to agree on clear boundaries that would not be violated. Dialogues were conducted with relevant officials of state agencies, the local government, and tribal leaders, along with the younger generation that included women, a genuine breakthrough given the conservative views of custom and tradition. It is not my purpose to go into further details of the project because this is not the proper forum for it. But let me just point out that among the outcomes of this project is the fact that the community finally enjoys a sense of security and peace in Esperanza, with armed groups are no, no longer able to harass people owing to the presence of traditional warriors whose authority was restored firmly after long years of living in fear. And for the first time, the younger Higaonan leaders, including young women and representatives of local government, came to the same table to talk about their human rights issues as part of the focus of the Human Rights Awareness Program. The discussions were earnest, objective, and peaceful, much to the surprise of the participants themselves. A significant development was the holding of a reconciliation and peace ritual between the two leaders after decades of distrust and Conflict. Among the lessons learned from this narrative, I would stress on a few. Conflict can give rise to both negative and positive aftermaths. We all know about the negative consequences, but these consequences should be seen in a new light, that of opportunities to transform the root issues that caused the conflict in the first place. What is required is a strong will among community members to work together in solidarity. And this solidarity is the foundation of the peace building efforts that only the community can do and eventually sustain for the simple reason that the community members develop a sense of ownership of these initiatives that are the fruits of solidarity. The Gaonan came together, built consensus, and moved as one to bring relief to the tensions between conflicting parties. They came to a realization that resorting to violence does not serve their interests and that it was necessary to come to an agreement on what situation should be changed and how. Both the local government and the Kikaon community also came to the realization that the most effective and powerful deterrent against armed groups that terrorized the villages was their solidarity, working together as one. Instead of emphasizing their opposing interests, they focused on their commonalities and learn to use them constructively to deal with their differences. All of these achievements were owned by the Higa The project team was there simply to facilitate. The project process, assist, and protect were necessary. The only thing the project ever gave the Higa was the space, the time, and the opportunity to gather and to meet, discussing and deciding on matters affecting their lives and the life of their community. The funding for the entire three-year project was provided by NCA. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has made a plea for selflessness and solidarity in the building of bridges to include the entire international community. International solidarity begins at home, at the national level, where human rights and habits of cooperation are born and nurtured so that they may flourish and expand across borders and boundaries and into the world. I conclude with a quotation from Eleanor Roosevelt provided to me in solidarity by Maria Rosa, whom I thank sincerely and I quote, where, after all, two universal rights begin. In small places, close to the home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any map of the world. Yet, they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory farm or office where he works, such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerned citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. 
Lastly, I hope the Secretary General will forgive me for taking liberties with his words that I quoted earlier on. Just like peace, solidarity will not take root if it comes from the outside. And just like peace, building solidarity is primarily a national challenge and a responsibility. Thank you. But then uh, we don't know where it leads us because uh, war and violence have a life of their own once uh, the process is started. And today, in fact, we can see the violence continues, not only independent groups like uh, the other day, the day before yesterday, the killing of four Americans in Benghazi, but we look at Syria, we look at Afghanistan, we look around the world. There are <coughs> moments and areas of violence in many places. So violence persists and it generates more violence. It took a long time for the public culture to arrive at understanding that the way of peace, even though it seems slower and less effective in the long run, is the way that creates the conditions for a better life. Even uh, within my tradition in the Catholic Church, the understanding of peace took some time to arrive at the point where war was justified to the conviction that dialogue and peace are the only viable way to resolve problems among civilized people. And the word solidarity is just the opposite of war and violence. Because solidarity implies reaching out to the other, not in, with the objective of destruction, but with the goal of creating something better in the meeting of the, the other person. So, if we want to exercise solidarity, we need a context of peace, first of all. And solidarity becomes the way to create a condition for a better quality of life for people. And so the precondition of peace, of avoidance of violence, becomes a necessity. I remember a case where I was involved. You know, you know that between 1998 and 2000, there was a war between uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea. At the time, I was accredited uh, um, Vatican ambassador to both capitals. <coughs> so my job was to shuttle between the two capitals, trying to make some sense. 150,000 young lives were lost for nothing in that little war, where modern means of warfare were utilized. And uh, to try to block the conflict and accelerate an armistice, the churches, both the Orthodox Church in Ethiopia, the Orthodox Church in uh, Eritrea, and the Lutheran Church of Sweden and Norway, tried to work together to create some kind of a dialogue and religious leaders made an effort to go to each of the two capitals to try to talk sense to the government. 
Prime Minister Meles in Ethiopia, who died a, a, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, President Afwerki of Eritrea, who is still in control of the situation, unfortunately, there. The, the peacemakers that wanted to generate an awareness of the futility of violence made a concerted effort across religious denominations, tried even to involve the Muslim uh, Iman, national Iman of the two countries, because of a deep conviction that any effort directed to build peace was going to save lives, first of all. And secondly, it was going to create a premises for reconstruction and for utilizing the resources available to improve the lives of people. An example of today's peacemaker is the operation Dog, the Operation Colomba, that the Association John 23rd carries out. These are volunteers who go on the spot and engage the local population to talk. They are trying to show not only with words, but through the presence, the physical presence, the relationship with the people on, on the spot, on the place, that the benefits of peace far overweigh than any uh, possible advantage that could come through violence. So as I said, non-violence becomes the context of solidarity. To bear fruit, solidarity needs an environment of peace. Because how do you achieve development in a poor country? Or how do you build bridges among the ethnic or tribal groups that have been for a long time, for centuries sometimes, fighting each other? And this is not only the case of Africa, where I have seen several ethnic groups fighting each other, even though the world press doesn't bother to report if there are only two or three thousand people killed, that's not a big news. Uh, but it is uh, important that uh, this process of peace building be personalized. I think the secret of the effectiveness is in the personal witness of some people that become engaged directly in, in, in uh, <coughs> building, building peace. And especially in the reconstruction period after conflict, the need to not only to rebuild the physical infrastructure, but uh, to uh, do work of demining all necessary steps for opening up the possibility of reconstruction. But I think what is more challenging is the rebuilding of human relations. How do you rebuild human relations when uh, people have been uh, violently engaged in killing each other? So people, volunteers, who are physically present and trying to dialogue and witness the possibility of reconciliation become truly uh, peacemakers. The work of peace building is an uphill struggle, but it is the only option that we have experience in history shows that Jesus' words remain valid. 
blessed of peacemakers. Volunteers who risk their presence in peace building are making a great investment, not only for all of us, but for the whole world. So, looking at the different groups of volunteers, the different efforts of building peace even today, Sometimes we may be tempted to be discouraged because what grabs the headlines are the war, the violent approaches to problem solving. And instead the silent and more invisible work of building peace is kind of relegated to the margin of the information world. But this is the only way that in the long run really helps solving problems and giving hope to people. Thank you.